The Cod, episode five. Tag team, back again. Your hosts, Paul and Ryan, sitting down with a very special guest, Neil Magny. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sitting down with us today on this episode five. Glorious day out there, I can see. <laughs> Beautiful color. Yeah, uh, just to have me on. Yeah, man. So what would, what was you up to earlier? Just uh, getting a bike ride in, getting some exercise in? Uh, no, just kind of Sunday's normally my day just kind of kick back and chill with the family. So like uh, yeah. uh, going to church and really trying to prioritize like um, being with the family. So I try to like not really do too much on a Sunday, just so I can be there with them and be present with them uh, rather than like being in the same room as them. But your mind's going in 10 different directions. Of course, of course, especially nowadays. You got to got to connect with the family. I mean, un- unrest, COVID. Why not? You know, when we're when we have the opportunity to sit at home and really quarantine, if you're not connecting with the family, I, I don't know what you're doing right now. So definitely, sure. definitely. But uh, let's let's uh, I guess let's start it off. We always, uh, I guess, like to get our guests to give a little background on themselves. Um, for the people who don't know who Neil Magny is, let them know who you are, how you came up. What's uh, I guess a little rundown on your career. Okay, cool. Yeah, so currently I'm uh, I'm signed to the UFC. Uh, it's the Ultimate Fighting Championships. Uh, right now, I compete in the welterweight division. That's 170 pounds uh, to 160 pounds. Um, and uh, as far as that, I've been with the UFC going on eight years now. Um, currently, I'm ranked top 15 in the world uh, for my division. Um, and uh, just kind of this kind of been my main focus the last couple of years, being uh, part of the UFC and see, see where it takes me around the world and the opportunities it presents me. Cool. And you recently won in uh, UFC 248 and 250, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was able to compete twice this year, even with the whole COVID situation. So nice. I'm definitely fortunate and blessed for those opportunities. And speaking yeah. on the uh, COVID situation, I see uh, at least the last fight, when we, we had spoke about the last fight on uh, the prior episode with um, Masvidal and Usman, and we had uh, said that they had fought on uh, Fight Island. Is there any opportunities for you to go over to uh, Fight Island and compete? Uh, no, nah, it was just too short of notice. Um, so yeah. they, like, right now with uh, with the COVID situation for the UFC, everything is uh, pretty much done play by ear kind of thing. So uh, it's real hard to plan things in advance and really get things set in motion. So um, you get a general idea of like, hey, you may be fighting on this date, um, but things can change on a daily basis. So uh, nothing's never really locked in. So just where I was at right now with life and – uh, everything else going on right now, I couldn't really just kind of pick up and go to Abu Dhabi and compete there um, mm. on, on short notice. I want to make sure I give myself uh, ample time to, to to probably prepare for uh, for the opponent and uh, uh, for the opportunity to make sure I go out there and, and showcase my, my best skill set. So um, it, it was just too short of notice for me to take any kind of fight on Fight Island. And it, it's, it's interesting that you said that, Neil, because as much as the people want to see sports and they want to see UFC, and they want to see the competition. Um, as antsy as the people are, you must be as well, right? Staying in shape, training, like looking at these fights that are happening right now. Like, I, I, how do you keep yourself motivated, man? Man, it, 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 I'm not going to lie, it is difficult. And, and sometimes you catch yourself just kind of uh, going through the motions of training. It's like, oh, you know what? I, I got a good workout in today. I worked hard today. Um, but you're not really doing the things to – uh, help you be successful in that time. I mean, uh, I can remember at one point during the, the whole COVID situation when things first got locked down, the gyms got shut down. So uh, I thought I was being proactive. I went and got some weights. I set up a squat rack in my garage. Right. Just like so kind of like stay on top of the training and that kind of thing right. to make sure I was still getting to work in. But right. um, it, it's just not the same when you don't have the, the coaches and teammates to, to kind of hold you accountable. I mean, there were times that like I would jump in and go, go do a weight workout, but I wouldn't do a warm up. I'll just jump, I'll just literally roll out of bed go down the garage and start lifting weights. No warm up, no cool down, nothing. Just just going in there. Um and, and thinking about longevity and uh and and best outcome, like this is not the right way of doing things. So I've exactly. uh, been pretty fortunate to get a good group of guys around me to kind of um help guide and keep me accountable as far as training goes. Uh and keep building even though uh time is around us so uncertain right now. Okay. Well, well hey Neil, do us a favor, man. Give us a little background about your uh, because I know you're a veteran as well as I am. Um, give us a little background about that, man, and what, what, what actually influenced you and motivated you to go into UFC after your service. 
Okay, yes, yeah, so I joined the Army right out of high school. Uh, I literally graduated on a Saturday. Uh, by the following Tuesday, I was on a plane heading to boot camp. I mean, um, at the time, it was something I, I really felt passionate about. I really thought it was, it, it was uh, uh, something I needed to do. I mean, I'm not one of those people that grew up that, that had, like, uh, ample opportunities given to them. So everything I had, I had to work for. So uh, my senior year of high school, I found myself literally like, man, here it is. It's time to go to college now. How am I going to make that happen? Am I going to uh, take this wrestling scholarship to a D3 school and write it out there? Or right. um, am I going to give myself more opportunities by joining the military and, and um, being able to pay for college that way, serve my country and that kind of thing. So um, luckily I went the, the military route and it opened up a lot of doors for me um, within the first couple months of being in the military, I was able to uh, start training hand-to-hand -hand combat and that kind of thing. And that really just kind of pushed my love for martial arts and, and uh, uh, really motivated me to just, just kind of stick to it. Um, and once I eventually got out of the service, I just kind of followed through with that as well. And you came up in Dalton, correct? Um, yes, yeah, so I lived in Dalton for, uh, for, for high school. And then uh, I went to Thorn High, Thornwood High School, which is in uh, South Holland, Illinois. Um, and I- Curves and socks, just, Curves and socks. What was that? Curves and socks. <laughs> um, definitely I go with the socks. I mean, all right, all right, all right, all right. I was waiting. Yep. All right, give it to him. Give it to I him. Mean, it's funny because like when you live in Chicago, around Chicago, everyone's always like, "Yeah, I'm Ryan Dash Sox fan." Ryan Dash Sox fan. As soon as the Cubs finally won the World Series, uh, whatever recently, it, it's funny to see the shift. I mean, I'm, it, it's rare you see a, a Sox hat now. Everyone's wearing a, a Cubs hat, a Cubs jersey, and that kind of thing. So it is interesting to see that shift. All right. Um, now I know I know you uh you studied uh Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. When did you uh when did you first pick that up? And I guess what was the uh path from um I guess after high school to to the UFC to signing into the UFC? Yeah, so in two thousand and five, going from my uh junior year to my senior year of high school, that's when I first started uh to really get get a taste for, for, for mixed martial arts. I, I uh it was literally a summertime. We had we had a setup where we were able to go to a world's gym. It was like just kind of a, a local gym that our football coach got us hooked up in to, to kind of lift weights and stay in shape during the summer. Um, but at the time, there was a guy, Miguel Torres, who um, rented a studio space in the back of the gym. And he was actually running his martial arts program out of that. So he had uh, jiu-jitsu, kickboxing, and, and a bunch of other classes that he offered. Um, and, I, and I literally just stumbled in one day. I was just like, man, I want to see what this thing's about. So uh, me and a couple of my high school buddies just kind of dropped in for a class or whatever, threw on some gloves, no mob guards, no protective equipment and nothing, just kind of kind of messing around, just trying to uh, see what this thing was about. And I literally just fell in love with it at that point right there. I was like, man, this, is, this thing is, is fun. I, I actually enjoy this. I mean, um, in high school, I played three different sports. I did football, I did wrestling, I did track. Um, you know, I enjoyed all of them. I wasn't necessarily passionate about any of them. It was just more so like the thing you did to stay in shape and uh, uh, get the girl's attention. It was nothing yeah, I was actually yeah. like truly passionate about. And then when, when I started doing martial arts, that's when I actually found that passion. I was like, man, I actually enjoy this. I want to uh, pursue this more and do the best I could. Right. Now, did you, did you uh, compete in college? How, how did you, uh, I guess, how did you um, make that first step into, uh, into the uh, professional sense, into the professional league from amateur okay. to uh, UFC? Yeah, so fresh out, like I said earlier, like fresh out of high school, I uh, pretty much jumped on a plane, went, went to basic training. Uh, as soon as I came back from basic training, I, I, I deployed in, uh, so I graduated high school 2006. I deployed 2007, uh, came back from overseas 2008. Um, to, when I was overseas, I was kind of, uh, it, it was towards the end of deployment. I was kind of in that position, like, man, I'm, I'm not sure what's next. I'm, I'm not sure if I uh, go back to the Chicago area and just kind of um, train martial arts, finish up college, and then, uh, uh, move forward like that or anything else like that. And um, one of my mentors in the, in the Army convinced me right now, you know what, like, I think you should go to Southern Illinois University and, and give wrestling one last shot. Like, there's something that, that you were passionate about. There's something that you enjoyed at one point. Um, I think you should give it one last shot. I want you to be sitting back uh, 10, 20 years from now and say, like, man, I could have been a, a pretty good or decent uh, college athlete. So he encouraged me to kind of go to SIUE and, and pursue uh, wrestling there to really kind of um, kind of, just, just kind of eliminate all the uh, uh, doubt in my mind as far as what uh -huh. I can do as a collegiate athlete or whatever. So um, I listened to him. I ended up going down to SIUE and, and uh, made the wrestling team down there um, <laughs> as, as the walk-on. Um, but it, it just wasn't – by the time I got to college, by the time I got to the wrestling team there, uh, the passion just wasn't there. I was, I was actually in love with martial arts. It was something I, I wanted to do and wanted to pursue. 
Um, so while I was down at SIUE, uh, I met up with a different fighter, Matt Hughes, who just opened up a gym probably seven, eight miles from, from my, where my uh, college was located. So um, I started going there and training. And um, at the time, it was, it was a lot of UFC guys that were training at that gym. So it really gave me an opportunity to get a, get a taste for it and see what the, what the pro life would be like uh, if I were to choose that path. So being a 19-year-old, 20-year-old kid, um, going against grown men who were fighting UFC for six, seven, eight, nine years, some of them. Um, it, it, it was a rough go around. I mean, I can remember <laughs> literally like, like leaving the gym with knots, bruises, and, right. and all types of stuff. On. And, it, was like, and, it, and it, it just kind of made me uh, really question whether or not this is something I wanted to pursue or not. And, uh, and I definitely did. I mean, when it comes to fighting, it's not like uh, – it's not like any other sport. Like when, if you want to compete in, in, in mixed martial arts, you want to be in, in a in a combat sport. Um, it's not the kind of sport that someone can convince you to stay stay around in. You either have that um, fight or flight mentality, and it, it right. and allows you to stick into it or or dip out. I mean, and, and that's what it was for me. I mean, being a, a young kid and getting uh, my butt handed to me day in and day out by some of these guys that were in the sports for years. It for me it was motivating. I was just like. Like, oh, you know what? You beat me today. I'm going to try to get you tomorrow. All right, you beat me today. I'm going to try to get you tomorrow. Um, and eventually, like two, three years of doing that, I was able to actually hang with the guys that were in the UFC um, at the time and, and actually start doing well against those guys. So it's something powerful that you just said, man. You said that getting your butt handed to you kind of pushed you, right? So, so that was a motivating factor, right? You didn't count your losses as losses. It's an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to move forward, right? So, so Yeah, 100%. So, so in, in that realm of things, like, what are your goals, man? Like, when you were coming up, when you were learning, you know, you were doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, what, what were the goals that you set for yourself? And what other forms of martial arts did you kind of take to, you know? Yeah, so uh, the three martial arts I did, or the two main ones I did was jiu-jitsu and, uh, and Muay Thai when I first started. Um, and uh, it, it, it was just a sport that made me find out a lot about me. And then and shortly, shortly after high school, I mean, I mean, back that a bit. Wait, once I got to the point I started playing sports in high school, um, that's what it was all about for me. It was about that that accountability and, and being able to check myself and really uh, see what I was doing and what I can do better. Um, I can remember my, my freshman year of high school when I first started getting into sports. Um, I had gotten suspended for uh, just, just goofing off with some friends in school or whatever. And I seen the wrestling coach in the hallway and I went up to him like, hey, coach, uh, I'm not going to be in practice next couple of days. I got this trip coming with my mom. Uh, I'm going to be out of town and, and just kind of try to like BS my way through this conversation and tell my coach why I wasn't going to be in practice the next couple of days. And he literally looked me in the eye and said, like, you're lying. You're full of crap. Uh, you got suspended for, for doing so-and-so today. Um, and that's why I won't be in, in practice later, late today or the rest of this week. If you ever lie to me again, you won't be on my team. And mm. uh, at, at 14 years old at that point, that was the first time this one ever called me out for, for my, my BS. That was the first time that someone ever put me on a spot and maybe like, I should be accountable for something that I said or did. And um, be honest, I didn't like it. I didn't like that feeling of like, like, damn, I just got, I just lied to someone and got caught in lying. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, it, it just didn't sit right with me. So uh, like, that literally was a, a point that started like making me really seek that like accountable aspect for everything I did in life. I mean, it, it doesn't mean I did everything perfect. Um, but when I, when I did slip up, when I did come fall short, um, it allowed me to actually be able to like take that feedback and figure out how can I do it better? How can I do it different? Did you uh, tune into the Usman and Masvidal all fight? Oh, uh, 100%. I mean, that, it's, a, it's a title fight in my weight class. I was watching yeah. that thing with a magnifying glass, literally. What, what did you think about it? Um, I thought it was impressive. I mean, uh, for, for Masvidal to take the fight on uh, on short notice like he did uh, and go all five rounds with a guy like uh, Kamaru Usman, I mean, uh, I think it was a, a great show for both guys. And uh, it, to be honest, it was a motivating fight. I mean, it really shows showed me what I need to do to get to that level and uh, – and, uh, uh, what I need to bring, the intensity I need to bring to each practice to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I bring that up because uh, earlier, you know, you had said you've taken to jujitsu and Muay Thai and um, you didn't really want to stick with wrestling when you had joined that team on, at uh, SIU. Uh, now, when we had spoke about the fight on the prior episode, we, we were um, kind of praising Usman's wrestling ability and how he used that against Masvidal. Um, seeing as they're both welterweights and you are as well, um, and you really, I guess, studying jujitsu and Muay Thai, have you come across any, I guess, styles that you have to pay attention to, sort of how Masvidal maybe not have, might, might not have been ready for a wrestler of Usman's, I guess, um, 
class and skill set? Is there anyone that you kind of have to like look out for? Um, I guess now that you know that jujitsu and Muay Thai is, is more in your wheelhouse. Um, so it, it's interesting. So with uh with MMA, like it, even though we're we're in there literally fighting one another, um, you have to somehow bring it back in and realize like, all right, this is this is kind of a game too. And and there's also there's all these different pieces that goes in there. So it's the it's the mental preparation. It's the um, it's the different skill sets that you throw out there and throw your opponent off. I mean, um, if I'm fighting a guy who I know is a better wrestler than I may be or something like that, how do I use the, my skill set to draw his wrestling? Or if someone's a better mm -hmm. striker than me, how do I use my striking to um, pretty much bring his striking down to the same level where I can get get ahead? So it creates like this whole like like chess match. of like, all right, cool. If I'm, I'm set up my three pieces here and kind of corner him to only move in this direction and when he does that maybe to capitalize on the opportunity so um the entire time i'm watching uh master usman fight um i'm just playing out a chess match in my in, in my in my mind like all right cool yeah you know, so let's so fight him how would i approach that fight if i was to fight usman how would i approach that fight um and to be honest it's two completely different um uh styles that i bring to the table but the same dog that being fight every time yeah, it's funny because uh, Masvidal said uh, famously at the end of that fight when they were interviewing him, he said, uh, "He said now I know how how he fights." You know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but, yeah. I mean, which, which kind of ties into what you just said. You know what I mean? It's like he he fought him. It's like it's like the chess moves. He did, he didn't know that he was gonna come at him in that, in that style or that way. And, and for sure, he was like now. And, I and it's one of those tough things to say because like uh, like. Like Masvidal going into that fight, he knew he was fighting a wrestler. He knew some things that wrestlers tend to do. Um, but Kamaru is a he's a versatile versatile athlete. He's able to switch things up and do things differently at a drop of a dime. So he couldn't just go in there with the mindset like, "Oh, I'm fighting a wrestler. This is how I beat him." Um, right. He had to literally like sit back and make calculated decisions. Like, "All right, cool. When he does this, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this to try to force him to do that." Um, and and that's what creates an interesting fight. I mean, you watch um, Masvidal against a guy like uh, Ben Askren. He, he knew the guy was limited in his skill set he knew he was a wrestler so when the pressure came forward he was going to dip his head and try to try to take a shot um when he did that he met him with the knee and was the fight was over in four seconds so um th these are the kind of decisions that the the general public tends yeah. to miss at times but um when, when you break the fight down it's, it's a lot more than just two guys locking the cage swing for the fences when you see which guy goes down first like it's a uh, it's a lot of calculated efforts that go, goes into it yeah and going off going off that question i guess what are the things that you look to pay attention to when you're getting ready to fight somebody what are what i guess what are the like the three main things that you really want to pay attention to when getting ready to fight somebody um, so the first thing I do is uh, I look at the, the things that I need to improve on because uh, once the fight comes down, the first thing that your opponent's to do is going to break down the film. Um, so I want to make sure that when, that when that next fight presents itself, I'm not going in there as the same fighter I was five, six, seven fights ago. I want to make sure I'm bringing something new to the table every time and I'm, uh, and I'm growing as a fighter. So um, whatever that guy was studying in, in, on tape or, or whatever that he thought might be a, a, a hole or – um, a weakness that you can exploit in the fight. I want to make sure that that weakness isn't there. Um, so that's the first, that's the biggest piece. Like my last fight, I fought on, on a Saturday. Uh, well, literally by that Monday, I was back in the gym. And it's not because I was just like, like bored or, or needed to, to, to occupy my time. It was more so like, all right, cool. That fight was close. I noticed some things I need to work on. Uh, let me get back to work on work and work on those things so that when the next fight opportunity comes through, I'm not backtracking. I'm not going back. It's like, all right, cool. Let, let's, let's bring it back to, eight weeks ago and let's focus on these before we move forward. I want to make sure that um, if I fight on Saturday, I'm already making those necessary adjustments to get ready for the next fight because I win or lose, I can't change the outcome of that fight, um, but I can't control how I go into the next one. So that's, that's the first thing I do. Um, the second thing I, that I started doing now is just uh, really starting to trust the coaches. I mean, um, at this point, I mean, I had 25 fights on the UFC banner over the last eight years. I mean, um, that's a crazy pace for, for anyone. But um, with having that many fights and fighting that often, you tend to you, you kind of develop this attitude of, of uh, complacency where it's like, I know what I need every single time. And uh, um, you, you kind of make rushed decisions at the time, so to speak. So it's like, I'm ready to go right now. Give me my next opponent. And I just, I'm just jumping in the fight, um, ready to move. So right now it's more about like trusting the people around me and making a, uh, that, that informed decision together. So if a fight offer comes through and it's four weeks away, two weeks away, where it may be, I'm not just jumping in there and say, oh yeah, let's go, let's go ahead and do it. I'm making sure that I'm on the same page with the people around me. And they're like, hey, you know what? Two weeks, I think you're good to go. I've seen a lot of good things out of you in the gym. Uh, and I think you're ready to take that fight. 100% uh, take that fight. So now I can go into that fight with, 
100% confidence that I'm going to be successful and I'm going to, going to win that fight. Um, and, and then finally, the third thing is, uh, is being uh, inten- intentional with my time and with my training. Um, so uh, a lot of times with, with fighting MMA, um, it, you have to make weight. So typically guys are walking around 15, 20 pounds above their fight weight. So a lot of their training camp is spent about, uh, spent dieting and making weight. Um, and that a lot of times can uh, kind of steal the focus of the fight. You spend eight weeks, 12 weeks, however long it may be. Um, and your main focus is like, oh, I have to get back to my fight weight. I, get, get, I have to get down to my fight. I have to lose two pounds a week for the next eight weeks in order to, in order to make weight. Um, yeah. So you're just worried about working hard. You're, you're just worried about going to the gym every single day just to, just to see what that, that scale says at the end of the day. Um, and for me, I have to make that switch where I'm not just worried about like getting in shape or, or what, what my weight may be. Uh, I'm worried about what I'm getting out of every practice. Like, what did my striking look like today? What my grappling look like today? What, what mistakes did I make and how can I improve on that? Like, I'm actually looking for those things uh, and, and looking forward to it. I mean, there are days that I have a I had bad days in the gym and I'm like, I know I today sucked, but what, what can I take away from it? I mean, uh, there were days where literally I'm getting my ass kicked. Sorry, like better words, getting my ass kicked in the gym to the point that I'm in tears. I'm like, I'm, not, I'm literally crying, running off the mat and I'm sitting in the back on a washing machine crying like, coach, I, I, just, I just can't figure it out today, man. This dude just is beating the hell out of me today. And normally I can beat this dude every day of the week, but for some reason today, I just, I just can't figure it out. Um, and it was like, all right, cool. Let's take a step back. What, what are you doing differently today or last night or last week that's allowing you to be in a position right now? Um, and then we just kind of build off of that. Now, I know you, uh, you had mentioned making weight. Um, do you have any plans to fight outside of uh, the welterweight division? Or right now, are you just focused on dominating, dominating that class? Um, I tried to. Uh, and, it, and for me, it was more about opportunity. Um, I feel like I can, I can do well against guys that fight at 185 pounds. But mm-hmm. um, what I can't do is dip my toes in the water at 185 uh, and then jump back down to 170. Yeah. Um, so if I'm going to fight – Excuse me. If I'm gonna fight at 185 pounds, I'd make a full commitment to doing so. I mean, um, I'm walking around at most 190 pounds, and for me to fight at uh, 185 pound weight class, I'll be fighting guys who are walking around between 210, 220, who are guiding down, losing weight to fight there. So um, I'm gonna give up a significant weight advantage going up to 185. So uh, if I make that decision, that's be a full on commitment for me to um, stack on some muscle and strength to really be able to deal with that um, that that different weight class. So uh, for me right now, my main focus is, uh, is, is welterweight. I feel like uh, I'm in a great position where my skill set, my body type, and, and, and uh, everything I bring to the table, is it makes me a dangerous opponent for anyone at 170 pounds. Hey, Neil, if you can think of anybody in your class that you'd like to be matched up with, man, who would it be? Ah, uh, Kamar Usman. And it's not even because... All right, all right. <laughs> Let's, Let's go. Let's Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You're the champ. I mean, you're the guy who has a belt from in my weight class. And um, if I want to, if I want to be the best, I got to beat the best. And and right now, the guy with the belt is the best in the division. So um, I don't care about BMF titles or uh, who the fans think I should fight next. If I if, if it was up to me, I'll be fighting the best guy in the world right now at weight weight, and that's uh, Kamari Usman. All right. Now, um, how did you uh, how did you come across the name Haitian Sensation? I saw. I saw online. It's a recent. It's a recent addition. It's a recent nickname. But uh, how'd you come up with that? Um. So for me, that was more so about uh bringing hope to people. I mean, uh, uh I've been fortunate to go to Haiti and do a couple of different mission trips. And okay. uh, every every time I get there, it's uh, it's 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 always an eye opening experience for me. Um, the, the, it's it's weird because like no matter where you are throughout the world, if you see a young kid starving, like everyone has that compassion in their heart where it's like, oh man, like there, there should be no child that's like going hungry or doesn't have a place to sleep. So everyone's willing to open up their wallet or open up their hearts to, to help out that young kid. Um, but what I noticed uh, my last mission trip to Haiti that I went on was that that the adolescent group, those those 14 year olds, to young adults, like pretty much like about 14 to 20 years old or so. Um, it's real it's a lot more difficult for those guys to, to get that compassion from, from people around the world. Um, they look at them as, as young men and they figure out like, oh, you know what, you're, you're a young man, figure it out. Uh, uh, go work, go earn a living, go, go do this, go do that. Um, and, and they somehow expect these guys to, to have it all figured out, uh, coming from orphanages, broken homes, and all types of crazy things. And the reality of it is just not the case for them. Like some of them don't even um, know what they can possibly do. Um, so, uh, 
I noticed when they found out that I was that was Haitian there uh, last time I was there, they were kind of surprised. It was like, oh, wait, what? You're one of us. You're you're like me. Yeah. You're, you're living in the states. You're doing this. You're doing that. Like that's no way. Like. I didn't think that, that was possible. I thought someone uh, who's of Haitian descent was only limited to this particular thing or this particular lifestyle or culture, whatever else it may be. Um, so me being on television, me being in the, U, uh, in the U.S., me having all these opportunities around the world right now, I want to use it to motivate those kids in Haiti. They're like, hey, man, like, I get it. You may be living in an orphanage um, from the time you're born to the time you're an adult, but uh, don't sell yourself short. I mean, you can do whatever you, you want to do, whether it's be a dentist, engineer, a doctor, whatever you want to do, you can do it. Uh, don't ever uh, sell yourself short. So I want to make sure they see that that Haitian representation um, everywhere everywhere possible, on TV, in a newspaper, in the press, where they can have that hope and belief in themselves that they can do something. Yeah. It's, it's unique that you said that, man, because Bill Lester kind of brought that up as well. It's like a lot of these communities uh, and a lot of and a lot of pe places that people don't really realize, you know, people of color don't feel like they have that opportunity. You know, they don't feel like they can step into that, that lim limelight or they can step into that arena of competing at the highest levels, you know. And I think it's important, especially just like you said, I mean, just going there and seeing the kids and them, them realizing that you're Haitian as well, you know, that they don't... That, I mean, that probably rocked their world. You probably changed some worlds j just talking to them and being there with them and, and, and them seeing you on TV and seeing you. Seeing yeah. you on TV. So. yeah, I mean, it goes a long way. I mean, like I said, growing up, it wasn't easy for me at all. I mean, it was, it was hard for me to get my own mother to believe in me at times. I mean, wow. uh, I literally had uh, like conversations with my mom were just kind of like, I don't know, you'll just be this, but your brother will be this and your brother will be able to take care of you and that kind of thing. So it was almost like this... Uh, this lack of self-worth or self-value that, that I had for a long time. So um, as a teenager in, in middle school and that kind of thing, it was really never um, a reason for me to try certain things. I was kind of like, like, God, whatever. Like uh, if my mom says I'm like an out, amount to anything, why, why even bother trying? Why, why not just uh, stay where I'm at and, and accept this particular lifestyle? Like, let me just, just be right here and, and have that be, be the end of it. But um that that my trip me going into high school there was like a lot of things that 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 shifted for me that helped me become the guy I am, I am now I mean uh it, it's funny because my mom kept every report card from the time I was in first grade all the way until I, I got got out of high school and if you watch you look at my report cards from first eighth grade it, it wasn't anything nice I mean it was literally it was only the teacher that tried to deliver me a message my report card literally said F U F U F U F U <laughs> and unsatisfactory oh, all the way man. down. That's what my report card said. I mean, uh, it even got to the point that I even had to repeat the seventh grade because um, the grades just weren't up to par. Um, right. And a lot of that had to do with uh, with self value and self worth. I was always told like, this is who you are. This is where you come from. These are your options. I mean, uh, my father passed away at six years old. My mom was a single mother living in New York City at the time. Um, so a lot of people like throw statistics out there. It's like, oh, well, uh, if you come from a broken home, you come from a home without a father, um, this is the likely outcome for you uh, based off statistics and that kind of thing. So uh, to a certain extent, I, I, I started accepting that. I was like, all right, whatever. Like, I don't right. care about school. I just want to uh, go in day in and day out and just, uh, just kind of live. Um, and when I got about 14 years, years old or so, that's when my life literally started changing. I mean, I remember, um, and, and it was another accountability moment. I remember, uh, one summer work with my uncle and, um, he was a real estate investor. So he had me just kind of, this it's kind of shadowing along, helping out where I could and that kind of thing. Um, and I remember at one point we were cutting drywall to, to hang or whatever. It was like, hey, measure this drywall for me. Tell me how long it is. Um, and I grabbed the measuring tape. I, I pulled it out and I started to, um, to try to measure it. And I couldn't tell him what the measurement was. I couldn't break down one sixteenth of an inch, one eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch. I, I didn't know how to read that measurement on ruler at 14 years old. And uh, it was another opportunity when my uncle was like, where's that measurement? And I was just like, uh, embarrassed, head hang low. Like, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it says. It's, it's 36 and uh, five of these little markers. Um, and he was just like, wait, you don't know how to read a ruler? And I was like, no, I, I never paid attention to that. Uh, and rather than him like kind of, condemning me or, 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 or bashing me or throwing me down. I was like, here, let me show you how to read this real quick. Um, and that really, that was, that, was a, that was a moment of accountability for me. That was a moment where I realized, like, all right, you know what? Uh, I kind of do need to take education a little more serious and uh, apply myself a bit more. Um, and it, it, that was one wake-up call for me. And then that following year, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to start doing sports now. And I had that run with my wrestling coach. And, and that was another, like, accountable moment for me. And by the time I got to my sophomore year of high school, I was competing with other kids to, to make honor roll. I was like, all right, you know what? So, so I mean, honor roll, I can make honor roll too. So um, I literally went from a point where it's like, 
low self value, low self esteem, all this other stuff are just like didn't really think I would mount anything to probably you know what I can be anything that I want. I can I can compete against the best of them in the world and uh and be whatever I want to be. Uh and I just kept just just kept applying myself to the point that I got to where I'm at now. Man, yeah. I appreciate that, man. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. Hey. <laughs> now, it's real because uh like Paul is saying earlier when we spoke to uh when we spoke to Bill, he had let us know that, you know, stick and ball sports, it's it's something that you can see the trajectory for um you know you do well in middle school you do well in high school you can get picked up by a good college if you're in college you can get picked up by the league um so that was definitely one of my motivations to ask you you know how did you um get started with ufc so i think you know you just speaking about this is going to give those kids hope um what is there is there any um charity that we can promote on our end um that you've worked with uh on your mission trips to haiti Yes, so uh, one of the, the main uh, company I partner with is uh, called Mission 111, um, okay. and they have uh, a group that works in Haiti and the Philippines. Um, but kind of like you said, I mean, even build my build my way up to, uh, to UFC where I'm at now, um, mm. I never had anyone give me anything that I wanted. I mean, um, when it came to getting to the UFC, um, I, I made up my mind, like, hey, you know what? I can I can hang with the best from now in the gym. I'm ready to test myself uh, against the, the other fighters in the world. Um, and um, nothing was going to stop me from doing that. I mean, um, I didn't have a manager that was making calls to me. I didn't have um, friends or coaches that made calls to me. I, I kind of took that all on my own to do. Um, so I, I would go to websites and try to figure out where the upcoming fights were. And then I would email every single promoter for the upcoming fight and ask them, like, hey, um, is there any opportunity I can get on your fight card? Um, and they're like, oh, man, we're, we're just full. It's not in the budget. Um, there's just not enough uh, money there or whatever else may be to, to add you on there. Um, so I was like, all right, you know what? Just, just keep me in mind. Like, if, if someone falls out or if someone opens up, I'm there. And I, I kind of did that from uh, Southern California all the way up to Wisconsin to, to uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Any, any single – any promotion that was – putting on a fight I was emailing them asking to get on there um and and that's how I started to get fights as a professional um once I got a couple of fights under my belt I was like all right cool you know what it's time to make a run towards the UFC now um and for me at the time um the easiest way or not the easiest way but the, the one of the biggest doors to get to UFC was to be awesome fighter TV show um so I was like you know what I have to do whatever it takes to get out to Vegas and try for the TV show Okay. Um, so the first year uh, the trials came out, I, I was able to um, just fly out there, try out, and I didn't make it past the first cut. So I, I was immediately cut from the uh, from the tryouts. So I was like, all right, well, that sucks. Let me get back to the drum board. Let me get back to training. Let me get back to fighting. Let me get back to competing. Um, and then uh, another opportunity came up where they were looking for, for guys in my weight class to compete. So I was like, all right, here it is. I'm going back out to Vegas again. Um, so I... I, I got myself out there, went out to Vegas, uh, went out to the show. Uh, this time I made it to the, made it past the first cut, past the second cut. And it got to the point I was doing an interview with uh, UFC president Dana White and uh, UFC matchmakers at that point. Um, and they were looking at my record, they were looking at my experience, and they were just like, ah, yeah, you just, you just don't have enough experience. We're looking for guys that have at least 10 fights or more, and you're just not there right now. So I got cut again <laughs> from the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, and it's like, damn, dude, like, I'm never going to get my, my, my chance to make an Ultimate Fighter right now. I mean, I, I tried out twice. I've been cut both times. And I'm not sure when next time they're going to they're gonna make a, a, a casting call for it. But sure enough, it was another opportunity to go out there and try it again. Uh, so hey. I was like, all right, here we go. We're going back to Vegas. Yeah. Um, so I went out to Vegas. I tried out again. Um, and at this time, they were, they were doing the Ultimate Fighter live season. Um, and the casting call was for both. Uh, lightweights and welterweights um, and at the end of that they decided to cut all the welterweights and only do lightweights so I'm just like damn bro like three times I tried to finish the show and I got cut all three times like what is it going to take to get to the UFC at this point um, uh-huh. and it it sure enough a fourth time presented itself for me to go out to Vegas for a, for a casting call and at this point it was uh it was a couple of weeks out of, I'm sorry months out of college I didn't really have the money to go out there and that kind of thing so I literally just overdrafted my my uh checking account and and uh and bought a plane ticket to go out to vegas uh, and try out um i didn't have enough money to get a hotel or anything so um i booked my flight where i was gonna land in vegas at night uh and then stay at the airport overnight 
and then take a shuttle over to the tryouts for the next day and try out then. So I literally did just that. I, I, uh, I booked myself the, a ticket by overdraft my account. Uh, I went out to Vegas. I slept in the airport that night, uh, woke up, uh, brushed my teeth in the bathroom, jump on the shuttle. It took me to where the tryouts were. Um, and I made it past the first cut. I made it past the second cut. Uh, I got to an interview with Dana White, and I was like, I, like, all right, dude, this is it. I'm just my first time. <laughs> <laughs> first, you, you guys I'm here. I'm here. So I didn't have enough experience. I okay. fought every fight I could over the last couple of months and, and got myself to this point. Um, and they literally looked at each other. It's like, uh, you're in. And I was like, wait, what? I'm in? I made it? I made the cut? Like, yeah, you're in. Uh, our guys didn't contact you a couple of weeks. And um, uh, that ended up being my, my breaking point to get in the UFC or get my opportunity to fight for the UFC. Um, and it's just been – that crazy roller coaster ride ever since. I mean, it, there's been some years where things are going great. I mean, other years I'm, I'm looking and asking myself, like, man, how the hell did I end up here? What am I doing? So uh, it, it's been a, a wild roller coaster ride so far. Hey, man. Oh, now we got, go ahead, go ahead. my bad. I was, I was going to say we got a little bit over a minute left. Um, oh, my bad. Yeah, man. No, I, I'm glad. I'm glad you got all that in. I was like, I don't want it to cut off, and I really oh, wanted man. to hear it, man. Like, yeah. you inspiring me. Yeah, I'm like <laughs> motivation, uh, consistency, hard work. Like, I mean, Neil Magny, all that, gentlemen. all that. But I do want to ask. I do want to ask on a very, you know, a lighter note. Are you going to be included in UFC four? Uh, so oh, they uh, yeah. they introduced the game, and yeah, I saw I saw online when I when I looked when I looked you up. I saw I saw they had uh, Neil versus Bruce Lee in UFC three. I was like, they crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they put you at the best. They put you at the best. Well, man. Yeah, I mean, and that's the cool thing, man. Like, it just, uh, like, I don't know. Like, I mean, even with going to Haitian cessation nickname, you want to motivate those kids in Haiti and throughout the world. I mean, it's just one of those things, like, you can't pick the hearts you were, you were dealt, but the way you play them can have a huge difference. And um, exactly. that's what I'm doing day in and day out. So, uh, um, it, it's cool to have my shortcomings and my favorites and where everyone can see them and realize that, like, hey, um, it's not all butterflies and rainbows. There's going to be some some down moments, but at the end of the day, consistency is going to pay off. Hell, yeah. Well, shout out Neil Magny. Right, thank Look you, for him in UFC 4. And I guess, hopefully, um, what do you got coming next? Just real quick, real quick. Oh, I'm trying to get back in there as soon as possible. So uh, I'm working on getting getting back there and fighting uh, as, as early as late August, early September. So um, if, if all the cars line up, I'll be fighting pretty soon here. Hell yeah. Thank, thank, thank you for your time, Neil. Seriously. Uh, no problem. The COD, episode thank five, you. Neil Magny, Mission 111. Check it all out. All right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank Thanks, you, man. Peace.